Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. Sorry for all the confusion. I'm, I'm a bit of an old-fashioned girl. I'm not used to working with Skype all the time. So, um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to the conference, David. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't make it to come to Charleston and make, try to make sure that uh, I'll be there next time. And, uh, well, I would first of all like to congratulate you and, uh, and all of you there. Uh, it seems to me that humanists, um, humanists in the space and all over the place, in, all over the world, have to be very courageous these days, and especially in the US, with the success of a very conservative and intolerant group of uh, very, to me, uh, extreme right religious fanatics in charge of your country. So uh, I, I would like to express my support and congratulate you and ask you to keep up the good work. So from, uh, from Belgium, there's a, a couple of things I would like to say on the secular state. And I have a very reason to take action these days for the promotion and protection of the secular state. As the uprise of religion in my country, Belgium, is, is bothering me and, and creating tensions. We have just a very small country, perhaps people uh, around there in Charleston have never been to Belgium. I am to come over. Uh, we've been found in uh, 1830. So that's quite recent in European history, and we had a, a very liberal constitution at the time. And um, at the same time, we had very strong Catholic roots as well. But the constitution with all the freedom, the freedom of expression and the freedom of religion, and the compromise with the Catholic Church was very important for Belgium to grow as a secular state. And I was born in 1976, and I grew up in a very open and tolerant society. And there was a lot of freedom for me as a child, as a girl. And I knew from my family that after ages, secular uh, decades of, of religious control, basically Catholic control, there was finally all this individ individual freedom, and it was like a great gift to my parents who were free thinkers as well. And my mom, for example, had told me uh, how difficult it was for her when she was a young woman to get to find a doctor who would prescribe pills. It wasn't um, an, an easy thing where she lived in, 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 in her region uh, to find a progressive doctor who would give you all the possibilities you needed. But when I was 16, that was already history, that wasn't a problem. And a lot of people in my generation think that we have achieved our goal forever. This fantastic freedom, freedom of expression and freedom to be who you want to be as an individual. And they think that we are safe, that our Western and free secular model is, will always survive and will always be maintained. And I'm not so sure. In my country, I see nowadays, and for a couple of years, uh, something that, that you can call the combination, it's not a complot, I don't believe in, in, in that kind of uh, things, but it's a combination of the cultural relativism, uh, respecting all traditions because they are sort of holy things, and that cultural relativism combined with the repressive left uh, it, on one hand, and, and on the other hand, there is the religious réveil, we call it, an uprise again. Religions become more popular as people are losing themselves and looking for new kinds of spirituality. And there is especially the, the rise of, of Islam. And that combination creates a lot of tensions nowadays in my country. There is coming won't sound as a surprise to you, but it also creates an upright of conservatives and nationalists who want to go back in history, not realizing that they are unable to go back in history. But these tensions uh, are um, actually creating a lot of problems in different domains. 
Um, I'll give you a couple of examples in the education system. Um, we, we have discussions with parents of Muslim girls. Uh, there is uh, the call to, to, let's say, demanding not to organize anything that is considered haram. That's the opposite of halal. And uh, so prohibiting uh, girls to take part in gym classes, to go swimming, to have the whole of the biology class talking about sexual education and all that stuff. And there's the call for Muslim schools. I think it's a very bad thing. We have a mixed system of schools, but you can say that in, in reality, all Belgian kids to get to school, whether they are uh, Muslim or Catholic or free thinkers or anything else. And for the integration and cohesion in society, I think that's a good thing. Um, we have discussions in other domains, uh, um, healthcare, sexual education, information on family planning and birth control. We have discussions on funding of religion, and I, I will talk about that later. As I uh, had a very conversation, a very good conversation about that topic with David, I was in New York lately, um, and we have discussion, discussions on shared values, and those are of course political discussions as well, uh, because it, it touches the heart of our nation, of our constitution, when you cannot agree on common value anymore as equality and freedom, freedom of expression, for instance. So let me uh, just touch three uh, topics uh, briefly, and um, uh, so so you can see what what my uh, concrete goal is. When it comes to uh, the so-called reasonable accommodations uh, religious groups ask for, we see that women are the first victims, and that's as as a feminist, uh, it really bothers me. Um, that we have to begin to fight all over, especially for Muslim girls. For a lot of young Muslim girls, there are no swimming lessons, as I said, gym classes. And they are really controlled uh, by brothers, fathers, nephews, uncles, uh, cousins. And they have less freedom than I had when I was 12 years old. And it, it, I find it unacceptable. It, it puts us back in time. And it, it, we're not the only European country dealing with that problem. Uh, and we are not the only ones that are uh, losing the grip on women's rights. We, have, we see the same problems in, in Poland, for instance. And there you can clearly see that Catholics and, and Islamists have become allies. And the political discussions we have, it, it's difficult. For instance, in the Senate, um, the problems I, I, I want to talk with my colleagues um, are mostly problems that um, comes to the secular state, such as Muslim girl. The discussion in, in the Senate is blocked by my Catholic colleagues, my Christian Democrat colleagues. And, um, they do want to defend women's rights, but because of religious traditions, those, those women's rights are under fire. Women have a more limited access to the labor market. So it's clear to me that women pay the price when religion gains the upper hand, and that should not be accepted in a true secular state. Women's rights are human rights, and it's obvious that religious uh, influence undermines these rights. So that that's why uh, my my uh, the title for my uh, discussion today was also human human rights no secular state no human rights, and I'm convinced that there are a lot of examples. I'll give you another one um, when when we talk about, uh, for instance, the freedom uh, of expression. And um, a while ago in our country, the religious leaders signed a charter that says that we shouldn't free use the freedom of expression. I think it's a very important right, the freedom of expression and the freedom of thought and, and uh, also the freedom of religion, of course. Um, 
but they they see that there is a polarization, especially because of the uh, terrorist attacks and 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 Islamic extremism in our cities. So uh, to stop that polarization, they ask us not to use to fully use this freedom to express ourselves or to make to draw cartoons to offend someone. Um, because they they suppose those religious leaders that certain people only will use freedom of expression to hurt the religious feelings of others and makes me think of what Richard Dawkins recently said in London that uh, it's it's perhaps not the goal of certain people to offend the feelings of others but certain people are always ready to feel offended and that's the problem with very religious people they are always ready to be offended they are never ready to laugh about things but always ready to be offended when I say that to my Christian colleagues they are a bit um, offended as well but that's too bad for them uh, yeah well sometimes you just can't help it even in the Senate okay um, so um, this is it's for me it's um, a very dangerous problem, problem that charter because uh, our Flemish minister president um, was there when they signed the charter. He didn't take any position, but he pretends that uh, by enhancing the dialogue with the religious leaders, we will have more cohesion in society. And I don't think that we need these people around the table to get more cohesion and to get more integration and to get more respect and tolerance because they have their own agenda they are not caring about cohesion in society they are caring about their own club and their own interests and uh, they are not going to improve tolerance uh, it seems to me they they are going to make use of of, of uh, the state subsidies that they receive uh, to to become bigger to become more, more powerful and to be able to, um, well, constrain the freedom of others and of those who think differently. And that's why I think, that, and that's one of my uh, actions I am undertaking uh, nowadays, I think that Belgium should uh, abolish the funding of religious organizations. We have a, a constitutional system, I already refer to it as a compromise with the Catholic Church we made in 1830. Um, and through that constitutional system, we give religious organizations state subsidies. It goes about um, wages for the priests, uh, infrastructure, uh, the pensions, uh, retirements, uh, so anything that has good with the religious organization is paid by the Britain government or by one of the other uh, authorities, sometimes local authorities. And it, it for the Catholic Church only, it, it runs up to, uh, if you include the religious education in school, it runs up to 800, 800 million euros a year. That's a lot of money. Belgium is a small country. And um, we are talking about uh, not even, well, maybe 10 million people, but not 10 million Catholics, and that's only for the Catholic Church. So you can add some, some uh, 15 million uh, for other religions a year. Uh, so you can also notice that other religions don't receive the same funding as the Catholic, that's one thing, so it's, it's not... Uh, uh, it's not equal, I mean, it's, it's not correct in the first place. Um, but as this religious diversity is increasing, uh, there is less and less transparency about how much money is involved, involved, where it comes from, where it goes to. There are also a lot of financial flows from Saudi Arabia uh, going to different mosques, but there is not enough transparency to see who gives the money and of course, if you, you get the money from someone, you also bring their message. So that's one of the problems we have. So less transparency, it grows more expensive every day as the Catholics keep on receiving the same amount of money while the others get more money as 
their number of uh, members is rising. So it, it, to me, that state funding of religious organizations is, is fundamentally undemocratic. It's undemocratic because religious groups are not accountable. They can't be held accountable for their actions. And everyone working with taxpayers' money should be held ac accountable for what they do with that money. Uh, they should demonstrate complete transparency. And this is not the case. In a secular state, in a true secular state, uh, of course, the government is not authorized to interfere with religious affairs, not with what they, not with the cult, not with uh, their opinions. That that is correct. But if you are not involved in their actions and there is no transparency, then that should also imply that these religious organizations gather their own finances and. Um, they gather their own finances and should be transparent about it at the same time. So in my views, the, the tax revenues have to be used to the benefit of society as a whole. And we can clearly demonstrate that religions center around their members and that they don't care about general interests. Uh, take, for instance, the examples of uh, uh, what we call euthanasia. Um, I believe it's... Um, it's considered um, the, in in other Anglo-Saxon countries free will to die, so to end your own life. We have this very liberal legislation about it. Uh, in Catholic hospitals, it is very difficult to get euthanasia. So they, they, we can clearly demonstrate that they have their own agenda and that they should not receive all the state funding because they don't res they don't even respect the law when it comes to certain things like the right to abortion and, and, and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm promoting right now uh, the case of Germany, for example, uh, regarding the funding of religion. It's a very interesting example. Uh, it's called the Kirchensteuer. And it means that uh, when, you, when you pay your taxes and, and you, uh, have to, um, you have to make a choice, that, that means that you have the freedom to pay your taxes, a certain amount of money to uh, what the churches of your own preference. Uh, and so the state has a certain role in it, but that is basically to um, ensure, to guarantee transparency about where the money comes from, the money that churches have come from. And when I listened to uh, David in New York, telling me about how uh, the religious groups in the U.S. Um, financing themselves and not having any obligation towards um, government when it comes to transparency. I think that the German example or the Italian example, Otto per mille, is, um, is very interesting because there is a certain control so you can uh, be sure that uh, the mosques, extremist mosques, don't get all their money from Saudi Arabia and don't get the political agenda from Saudi Arabia or Turkey. We have a lot of um, Turkish mosques that are facing problems because they are promoting uh, not Islam, not a kind, uh, also a kind of Islam, but they are most of all promoting Erdogan and his uh, new caliphate that he's installing in Turkey. So that, that was one of the examples of the secular states a, a while ago. Turkey was a very modern secular state, of course, with a, a very great Muslim population, but it was quite different from other countries in the Middle East. And uh, all over Europe, we have a lot of Turkish immigrants. And um, by financing mosques from Turkey and sending preachers from Turkey, um, Erdogan had a gigantic control over uh, Belgians with Turkish origins. And it's, it's a problem that we have to tackle also by um, changing the legislation when it comes to the funding of religion. So I think that's a, a, a quite a technical way of approaching the problem. Um, just I, and I think it's the only way, because you cannot um, pretend that you're going to uh, 
solve the problem by saying that being a humanist is so much better, even if it's true. I mean, being a humanist and being an atheist is, of course, much more fun and, and it brings you joy in life than, than being an extreme Catholic, but that's not how we are going to win this fight, I think. When it comes to Belgian politics, I, I prefer to work on uh, um, some, um, let's say, a consolidation of our constitution. I, I want to see that part of religious leaders in the bin. I, I want to see it burned somewhere because I don't want it to influence uh, our legislation. I think that the, the equality between men and women and the freedom of expression, the freedom of belief, the freedom of press, is, that is holy to me. And it should not be uh, constrained by religious leaders that pretend that they're fighting for tolerance. So I think that liberals all over my country and all over Europe have to unite and uh, um, be very aware of the problem. Because we had the Charlie Hebdo attacks recently. People were, were killed for drawing cartoons in Paris. Paris is, is, is only 300, not even 300 miles away from where I live. And uh, everyone was saying on Twitter, je suis Charlie. Everyone was Charlie. Everyone was sad because of these uh, humorists that were killed. But one year later, we have religious leaders joined by our minister president signing a chart which they ask us not to fully make use of the freedom of expression. It's shocking. It's, it's worrying. It's worse than worrying. It's unacceptable. They have forgotten that all these people said, je suis Charlie. Or if they haven't forgotten, they, they just don't understand what they were saying. But that's, uh, that's the thing I, I want to conclude with that. Um, that's the, the, um, our main challenge is to uh, safeguard and, and make sure that freedom, make sure that uh, religious leaders don't get the influence that they want um, pretending to put an end to polarization. Maybe the polarization has to go on for a little while and we have to arm ourselves with good arguments and uh, try to, to, to change, give it a shock to the system so that we can show people again what freedom means. Thank you.